Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our latest installment of Global Conversations. On behalf of Invest Corp, I'd like to welcome you all here today, and particularly as we have participants joining us from three different continents. My name is Lahan Sparing, and I'm part of the Invest Corp Private Wealth Team here in the Gulf. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming a very special guest, the Honorable Governor Jeb Bush. Governor Bush served as the 43rd governor of the state of Florida. He was a third Republican elected to the state's highest office and the first in the state's history to be reelected. Most recently, he was a candidate in the Republican presidential nomination in 2016. During his two terms in office, Governor Bush remained true to his principles and championed major government reform in areas ranging from healthcare and environmental protection to civil service and tax reform, with education being his top priority. Governor Bush will be in conversation with none other than InvestCorp's executive chairman, Mohammed Al Ardi. Mr. Al Ardi has been spearheading InvestCorp's global expansion since 2015. And under his new mandate and vision, the firm has successfully increased its assets under management from $9 billion to $40 billion in just six years. Governor Bush and Executive Chairman Al Ardi will be discussing the year ahead through the lens of politics, the economy, education, and the ongoing global pandemic. These interdependent areas are fundamental and have the capacity to shape the coming year and beyond. We're all very keen to hear your thoughts and perspectives on the year ahead and your outlook for 2022. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Mohammed. Lahan, thank you. And uh, Jeb, an honor to have you on this uh, platform. Uh, let me start really by uh, asking you something about yourself and your family, because you know, you, you come from a a very well-covered and well-known and well-respected family across the world, political dynasty. Uh, but I noticed uh, in your journey, you did things a bit differently. You, uh, uh, you went to Latin America, you went to university in Texas, not uh, uh, Yale, you uh, uh, moved to Florida. Uh, how did that come about? Well, Mohammed, first of all, I'm, uh, it's a delight to be with you. Uh, I'm a proud partner um, in a small way with your incredible enterprise. And um, it's a joy to be with We're you. Very proud of that. In, uh, in my case, you know, I kind of followed in some funny way, I followed the footsteps of my dad who grew up in, in uh, New England, was born in New England, grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, went to a boarding school, served in the military and then went to Yale. He could have stayed in a comfortable place in, in Connecticut or New York and you know joined a finance shop, maybe, I don't know. He could have done something that was a little more what people expected. And instead of that, he moved uh, his young son, George, and his wife, Barbara, to Midland, to Odessa, Texas, and then to Midland, and uh, became an entrepreneur. Um, and then, you know, laid his roots in Texas. In my case, I grew up in Texas. I was born in Midland, grew up in Houston. And in, in high school, I uh, met a woman named Columba Garnica de Gallo in Mexico. And I fell head over heels in love. I literally, it changed my life. I described my life before Columba BC and after Columba AC. And so the age of 19, I just I knew I was going to marry her. And because of that, I got out of school with a Latin American studies degree at the University of Texas in two years. I went to work for a bank in the in the Latin American division. Uh, I married her 48 years ago in two weeks. We've been know, known each other for 50 years. And so my life really was motivated by wanting to be with her the rest of my life. We moved to Venezuela. At the, from the bank. And then after uh, I worked in my dad's campaign in 19, 1980, a long, long time ago, um, and then President Reagan's campaign, I moved to Miami in, on January 1st, 1981, and never looked back. So I'm bilingual, bicultural, my children are the same. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm so blessed to be the husband of Columba Bush. Fantastic. That's, that's great. And, uh, Talking about uh, the uh, uh, political journey, uh, 
What about the young uh, Bushes, the new generation? Are they getting into politics? Well, some of them have tried. Um, a lot of a lot of the next generation are actively involved as volunteers in campaigns. My son Jeb, who's my partner, certainly is uh, would fit fit that description. But my oldest son George has won two statewide elections in Texas. Uh, he's the land commissioner, which means he manages the Texas-owned assets. And underneath those, Mohammed, you'd be interested in this. Underneath all of that Texas-owned land um, are mineral rights uh, and royalties. If it was a business, it'd probably be a $50 billion market capitalization business just on future cash flow. So he has a big job, but he wants to be attorney general. He's running for that right now. And um, it's a rough and tumble primary. Politics is a contact sport in the United States these days. And so he's fighting hard. And the primary is March 1st. And we'll see if he's successful. Very good. Very good. So. Uh... Related to that uh, and to the uh, political season now that's coming along, inflation uh, is at 7%. And uh, you've seen the volatility in the, in the markets in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, even if it uh, calms down, people say probably be 3 to 4%, which is uh, twice as we have uh, had in the recent times. Uh, so... My question to you is, what effect do you think that is having on investors, uh, on businesses, on communities? It kind of depends on the sector, I think. Uh, most, most businesses haven't experienced inflation since when? Since the 1980s at this kind of rate. Um, I remember campaigning for my dad uh, and Ronald Reagan in 1980 when interest rates were 19 per prime rate was 19 percent unemployment was double digit inflation was 12 percent but most people haven't experienced this so i think there's major adjustments going on um, we've had a period where technology and innovation has really suppressed prices has, has been deflationary that still exists but uh, these price you know i i think one thing is clear it's having a big impact on um the the um mindset of voters going into this election. So sector by sector, they're trying to sort out what, what impact that'll have on inflation. But, but I know from a political point of view, this is devastating for the Biden administration because whether he likes it or not, whether he's totally responsible for it or not, presidents get, get the credit and get the blame for everything under their watch. And when you go to the grocery store or go to the pump to fill up your gas tank, and most Normal people don't live, you know, in New York and places where they have mass transit or they can walk or whatever. You know, the opinion leadership is totally in a bubble. Rest of them, working Americans are seeing extraordinary increases, bigger than 7%. And so I think that creates lots of uh, um, concern. Uh, certainly, you know, if you look at the uh, right track, wrong track numbers, Americans Democrats and Republicans uh, alike or believe, a majority believe that we're on the wrong track. So, yes, I think some of this is transitory, but I think uh, the Federal Reserve and the Biden administration has been incorrect to suggest that all of it's transitory. And um, I'm not sure they're doing much to, to rectify that. So uh, uh, coming to uh, the midterms, uh, there's inflation, as you said, uh, inequality. Uh, is the Democratic Party in trouble in the midterms? Is, is this a big opportunity for the Republican Party? It's a very big opportunity. Um, look, it, the second year of a incoming president's term almost always um, creates the opportunity for the opposing party to win in the congressional right. races. There's, it's only been, I think, one, re one, one off year election, 2002, which was a unique year when my brother was uh, president because the country was at war uh, and there was a unifying, you know, the country was basically unified around, uh, around um, supporting the troops that uh, Republicans picked up one or two seats. But generally, the party out of power picks up seats. And you combine that with this very hyper um, partisan uh, and very angry environment in our politics today. Um, 
you know, you, you can see most people would would believe the Republicans will pick up seats in the House for sure, where the, where they'll gain control of the House. And, and the Senate's a little more difficult, but it's uh, to 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 estimate. But it, I think the consensus is that Republicans could win both the House and the Senate. Um, a lot of that depends on the quality of the candidates. Mohammed, when I ran for office, I, I ran three times uh, for governor. I lost against a guy who never lost. I won against two candidates that weren't as good as the guy that I lost to. My advice to young people running for office is run against bad candidates. You have a better chance of winning. And in the case of uh, 2022, if Republicans elect the best candidate that has the best chance of winning, it should be a great um, great November. But if we elect people who who have no chance of winning the general but could win the primary, which we've done in the past, uh, that would be the only way I could see how uh, Republicans don't pick up seats in the House and the Senate. Uh, so talking about uh, elections and winning, uh, Glenn Youngkin, somebody, someone we know, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, impressive man, uh, did something amazing from private equity to governor of Virginia very, very quickly. It's not easy to, to do. And uh, ran a smart campaign. He uh, got the support of former uh, President uh, Trump, but not overly. Is that, uh, you think, a, a good model for uh, other Republicans to do? Yeah, he, he really, I mean, the pres he didn't, I don't think he asked for the president's support. He was probably grateful that he got it. It wasn't part of his campaign, per se. He didn't do anything to anger the former president. Um, he managed that process, I think, very well. But he ran a campaign about Virginia issues. And particularly in an off-year election, um, the backdrop is going to be bad for the Democrats. Candidates running ought to talk about what they want to do, particularly at the state level. So governors can create their own agenda. And I think, I think Governor uh, Youngkin now has did a really good job focusing on crime, education, and economic development, creating jobs, highways jobs, and, and making sure that parents' voices were heard and dealing with uh, what's occurred in our country, which is an increase in violent crime all across the country uh, in places where law enforcement uh, hasn't received the support that it deserves. So um, I think he ran a phenomenal campaign and I think he's going to be a really good governor as well. Um, all those, I, I think agree. it's, you know, I actually think it's kind of interesting, a private equity guy. Um, they don't normally like uh, it's, you know, it's kind of hard for private equity uh, to translate private equity experience into the political realm. Um, he didn't, he was proud of his uh, success at Carlisle for sure. And deservedly so. Um, he didn't abandon his experience. Uh, he managed that well too. So he's a good lesson for a lot of people that uh, may want to go from the private sector to um, politics. And he's a good person too. I mean, it came across really well. You know, one of the things in in elections uh, that people sometimes forget: people don't like to vote. That people won't vote for someone even if they share their views if they don't like them. There's, you have to be likable a little bit. I mean, and Glenn Youngkin came across as a very likable, compassionate, um, sensitive, thoughtful guy and very positive about his approach. So it is a good model. Um, and I hope other candidates uh, on the conservative side of our politics will, will embrace it. I think, you know, actually, I think everybody should embrace it. We need to get back to that kind of uh, campaigning because it also sets the stage for that kind of governing. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you uh, uh, talking about education, you mentioned education. Education was a big part of uh, your profile uh, in Florida, and uh, you did some amazing things uh, there. When you look now at uh, education in the U.S. in particular, particularly in the light of this cancel culture uh, grip and uh, crisis of uh, student debt. What are your thoughts there? How, how do you think is the way forward? You know, um, my, my focus uh, as governor was mostly on K-12 education and I have a foundation where I continue 
to work um, on reforming K-12 education, but our higher education system needs dramatic reform as well. Um, you, you, know, you mentioned the cancel culture, all of the illiberalism, the narrowing of opinion and speech. Uh, it's, it's absurd. <laughs> In a college, the whole point of higher education is to explore ideas and seek truth and uh, narrowing people's ability to have a different view is very dangerous in my mind. And so there's major pushback taking place right now. And that's very, that's hopeful in my mind. I, I just, I think this is a, the progressive left, left uh, has captured kind of the, a lot of the institutions in our country, big corporate America even is embracing a lot of this. Look, diversity and inclusion is very important, but when it, when it comes to the point where you can't have a view uh, that's, that's the mainstream view you know, determined by a group of elites, that's, that's just wrong. So I hope that there's continued efforts to um, support liberal education, if you will, where there's, where there's a range of views. Student debt needs to be reformed. I mean, you have, uh, you have major debt on the top, that's recourse debt. It's first in line to be paid back. Uh, and higher education costs, they used to talk about in the United States healthcare inflation as though that was a separate thing than regular inflation. Now you have higher ed inflation, which is even higher than healthcare inflation. And the reason for this is that there's no accountability. You don't have uh, increased graduation rates and the majority of students that go to school are going to public universities. The graduation rate is stalled, it's not increasing. Uh, the costs of administration are borne by the students through the financial system. And so I would, I would propose pretty radical reforms. In fact, I did it when I was a candidate that would put a cap on student debt uh, and, and require universities to accept student debt to lower their administrative costs and focus on you know, if you can, you should graduate in a four year, in a, with a four year degree in four years rather than six. And we measure mm -hmm. degree completion in six years for a four year degree. Maybe we should call it a six year degree, Mohammed. I mean, maybe that's the, the approach. And then on the elite mm -hmm. universities, you know, they are, uh, the costs are extraordinary. So yeah. a lot of the institutions we've relied on to create prosperity and create the greatness of our country have not been reformed over the last 50 years. And I think it's time, whether it's healthcare, certainly our immigration laws, um, higher ed, K-12, there's a lot of work to be done. And we're in this polarized environment, which makes Washington at least uh, a, a difficult place to get bigger things done. In, in education, uh, Jeb, who, is there a country in the world that you look at and say, really, this is a success story in education? They've, uh, they yeah, I mean, there, be the there, leaders. there are a few uh, for different reasons. Um, Amanda Ripley wrote a wonderful book about this where she followed the life of, I think, four students that were American students that went to study a year abroad in high school in Finland, Korea and uh, a couple other places. And, and what, she, what, what she wrote about and what our studies have suggested is that in Finland, for example, um, the, the, profession, the teaching profession is one of the highest professions in the country. So pay is better, but it's more, it's just in terms of status and prestige, being a teacher is really, really important. Uh, in right. Korea, families, parents, are integrally involved in, in student success. It's a cultural value in Asia, particularly, that their child uh, will live a better life than they because they were given the opportunity of a high quality education. It's very competitive. I mean, there's some downside um, elements to this, but the education is just a cultural value there. And I think the combination of those two things it, with innovation, which the United States has been a leader in, uh, and, and then in our case, we, we have to deal with the, the uh, digital divide. We have to deal with the inequities that start way before wealth creation and job creation. If you, you know, haves and have nots now are being created through our education system. And so making sure that 
lower income students have the same quality education and the same choices, their parents have the same choices as affluent uh, students, needs to be the highest national priority. I think if we combine the best of other countries with the unique nature of our country, we could we could reform K-12 in a much better way. Yeah, yeah. Now let me take you as uh, for the the coming the coming year. And uh, while we've had a couple of years of really some pain and gain and uh, COVID, uh, there's also a lot of optimism around the world. I mean, the United States economy grew last year by. Uh, a rate uh, never seen since the Reagan times. Uh, here in the Gulf, uh, Saudi and UAE are put in the uh, head list for uh, Bloomberg, most resilient economies uh, growing under COVID. Uh, what are you optimistic about uh, for this, this year and, and forward? Well, I think the recovery has been great, but we're not back to where we were in the sense that if you, you know, if you looked at a projected growth rate prior to the pandemic, we were accelerating our growth and then there was a dramatic drop. And now we've caught up to where we were, but we haven't caught up to where the projected growth would be. So there's more growth that will take place. And that's good. I mean, we have full employment. One of the challenges is workforce participation is very low. So I think the, the challenge is to make sure people have the skills for the jobs of the future. There's huge shortages for teachers, truck drivers, nurses, a lot of the areas that have been really stressed by our supply chain problems and, and certainly COVID. Um, if, if, to be successful, I think we need to make sure that more and more people are back in the workforce in these areas, our, our growth will be limited. Um, but, but our prospects are good. I mean, I think, I think we, sh we could have sustained growth over a period of time. Long term, you know, you have to you have to, I think, look at these bigger uh, issues of reform. Um, but it, the, the positive is infrastructure bill was passed. That's, a, you know, one point two trillion dollars is a lot of money. Uh, if it's implemented effectively, that'll create economic activity and, and economic opportunity. Uh, the faster money gets into people's pockets uh, and jobs are plentiful, the more optimistic people are and the less divisive our politics will be as well. So, you know, God willing, we'll be in a period here of sustained growth over the next two or three years, and that'll be helpful for our country overall. I agree. Uh, taking you, Jeb, outside the United States, I mean, uh, one of the big, obviously, questions now is the relation between China and the United States and how is that going to affect uh, you know, doing businesses, uh, global economy, trade. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on this? How, how do you think is uh, both uh, governments are managing this going forward? You know, I think um, China has uh, abandoned the path that many Western observers and investors thought that they were on, which was to not only be you know, integrated into the global economy as a, as a leader, but um, uh, uh, embracing the systems around the global economy. Um, there seems to be, uh, China's going on a different path. Uh, and, and I think that's gonna create big conflicts for us. And as a nation, um, we, we're the only nation that can confront their ambitions in terms of military ambitions. Uh, we need to be clear that we stand with, with Taiwan, for example, uh, and certainly our allies, uh, Korea, Southeast Asia, and Japan. So a recommitment to that, would, I think, is important. Um, we don't want to create a war, a trade war, or any kind of war with China, because we are interdependent, both of us. We need to find some common ground here. Um, but recognizing that China is different today than it was a decade ago. And I think, uh, Mohammed, this is one place where Republicans and Democrats increasingly agree. So my guess is that you'll see uh, the Biden administration now is distracted legitimately so with uh, the, the challenges of Russia. Um, their, I think their path was to really uh, be more engaged on the China issue, but that's 
that's, uh, that's changed at least temporarily. Um, but I hope they're strong and consistent and, and create a, a path forward, not just for the United States, but for um, Europe and other country, other regions of the world to uh, see if China can, you know, um, move back into the community of, of nations. Uh, right now, that doesn't appear like it's uh, the path forward. But, you know, we don't get a very good sense of the strength of Xi inside the country. It looks as though he's, you know, all powerful, but you never know. I mean, it, there's not much transparency in that regard. So I'm not, uh, I would have been more optimistic a decade ago than I am today. Okay. Now, uh, uh, there is a, there's a flashpoint around the world. One of them, obviously, is Taiwan, you, you mentioned, and uh, Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, do you think uh, we're going to see some bad news in 2022? Oh. <laughs> I, you know, um, it's dangerous to make predictions about Ukraine because there are over 100,000 Russian troops uh, in Belarus along the Russian-Ukraine border uh, staging in Crimea and, Crimea and other places. So uh, it appears like there will be a conflict. The degree to which the intensity of that conflict is, I can't, I'm not smart enough to know. Uh, the Biden administration seems to um, be more focused on this now, which I applaud. Uh, there, the Congress is proposing a set of sanctions, uh, which I think would be appropriate, more than appropriate to um, lay out in advance so that the, the, the Russia and Putin understand what the consequences of any action they take uh, would occur. I, I, I think um, the, the, um, the pipeline between Russia and, and Germany should be halted. That would be a significant signal. Um, Germany does not have the same view as uh, uh, Eastern European countries in the United States in that regard, but um, we do have the capability of stopping that and we should, in my mind. Um, the idea that, that Western Europe would be more dependent upon Russian gas when there's available gas from the Middle East and the United States and other places is, to me, makes no sense. Um, there should be efforts to make sure that there's a, that Putin understands there's a price to be paid. And then there needs to be some kind of exit ramp for him as well. There needs to be a carrot and a stick here. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is where American leadership really matters. You know, it matters in the in in your neighborhood. It certainly matters uh, as it relates to uh, as it relates to North Northeast Asia, and it and it it matters uh, right now in Ukraine. I don't expect American troops to be involved in this, but we there are tools that we can use, uh, particularly if Europe uh, is uh, you know we do this in unison with the uh, EU, um, where. We could re there could be a peaceful outcome and Ukraine can be sovereign and free, which is what the aspiration is of the Ukrainian people. Yeah. Uh, Jim, you mentioned uh, the uh, Middle East uh, and uh, the region have uh, enough of it is uh, issues. Uh, one of them obviously is uh, Iran and uh, uh, wondered what are your thoughts on uh, possibility of uh, uh, agreement with Iran or how do you see the future of that relationship between the United States and, and Iran? I don't see, I don't see a, a potential agreement that would create more stability in the region. Um, my own personal view was that the Obama administration's efforts with Iran were, um, did not create any stability uh, because they weren't comprehensive, uh, Iran continued to use its resources uh, to destabilize the region. And uh, there was no halting of that. Uh, and there should have been, if there was to be an agreement, I think a broader, um, a broader view, not just as it relates to uh, the creation of nuclear weapons, but also exporting their ideology and revolution to destabilize um, other parts of the other parts of the region. So uh, this is a place where I think President Trump's
policies, I think, deserve credit. Um, supporting um, the efforts uh, against Iran. And then, you know, I saw yesterday uh, an incredible sight of the Israeli president listening to the national anthem of Israel in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> wow. I mean, like, I, I don't know. I mean, it may, that may not be a, a, as big a deal in, in the region, in, in the Gulf or in the Middle East, as it appeared to me. But to me, that was a pretty amazing uh, that is a big deal. I mean, it's it's uh, so efforts along that path, I think, are the best path forward to create security and peace in the region. Others may disagree. And I think the Obama, administ the Biden administration is comprised many of their foreign policy folks. They're certainly experienced and capable, but um, they're it's almost as if they want to undo many of the things that the Trump administration did whether or not they were effective or not. And this is a place where I think the Trump administration policies were effective and what they should do is build on that rather than tear it down and try to go back to what's to something that I don't think was that successful and created more instability, but we shall see. It's um, given the fact that what's going on in China, our supply chain issues, um, our national security challenges, the, the threat on Taiwan, the, the Russian, potential incursion in Ukraine, the, the efforts as it relates to Iran seem to be off the headlines, at least these days, um, rather than beginning, you know, getting uh, the full attention of the United States. Uh, Jeb, let me uh, come back and ask you about uh, really uh, you as an investor and uh, a businessman, and what really, what do you see as the sectors uh, in the American economy and, and globally that should be, you know, we pay attention to and you see growth and robustness in them? You know, I would say two, two general themes um, have emerged. One is the innovation economy. How do you invest going forward in the massive amount of disruption and innovation that's taking place in the United States and around the world? Uh, it's, it's perilous because you know, the incumbents um, can either transform how they operate and become better businesses or they're going to be wiped out. And so how you, you know, who you pick as a winner and loser in a time of incredible um, tumult is, is, is hard to do, but there's all sorts of opportunities there. Uh, and, 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 and where does that play out? It plays out in big elements of our economy, healthcare, for example. It's roughly now 20% of our GDP we spend trillions on healthcare. Uh, we spend double per, per person than any country in the world. I mean, our, we have the best healthcare, but the most expensive by far. And so investing in businesses that are lowering costs and improving quality is a place where we're looking to invest. How do you take care of frail elders? Our population, um, not dissimilar to the rest of the world, is becoming older and people are living longer. Um, and the demographic pyramid that used to look like a regular pyramid is starting to be inverted. And so right. big opportunities in managing the care for the elderly. Um, we're, as I said, we're partnering with private equity firms, investing in businesses that have uh, unique technologies to be able to do that effectively. The other place I'd say where there's huge opportunities in the United States and probably in the rest of the world is digital infrastructure. There's a, there's a huge need. There will be trillions of dollars invested in how you, how you um, make sure that there's access to high-speed broadband, um, how you get fiber into every home, how you allow for businesses to access this incredible infrastructure that's being, that's, you know, gr growing in terms of its uh, quality at warp speed. And so, that's a place globally that I think there's big, big opportunities. And then the third place where, you know, the world is really focused right now is alternative energy sources. And I, you know, I think there's one of the things that we're, we're seeing, uh, we don't invest in the energy space, but we see a lot of uh, people that are. And I think the interesting thing is to take, is to make hydrocarbons more efficient rather than 
naively think that we can wean ourselves off of hydrocarbon like in 10 years. It's just, it's not going to happen. And, um, and I think by thinking it can happen, you're actually decelerating the innovations that could come from decarbonizing hydrocarbons. I mean, by lessening um, the carbon. And there's, again, there's major technological innovations taking place in that regard. So those are three areas. Yeah. I mean, but this is an exciting time. I mean, we're, we're, there's so much innovation taking place, disruption of financial institutions, disruption of insurance, how you, you know, the care for, uh, in healthcare, uh, harnessing technology now um, for a lot of, a lot of good in the world where, you know, you can invest in businesses that are going to be profitable is pretty exciting. Hey, Jeb, one of the one of the regions of the world that's close to you, uh, we don't know much about is Latin America, and I uh, place that you know. Uh, what can you tell us about that region and the you know the potential of uh, of that uh, part of the world? You know, we've had an interesting conversation here talking about Asia, Middle East, a little bit of Europe, uh, and certainly China and. And uh, typically when you have these broader conversations, Africa and Latin America are always ignored, but it's also a place in the case of Latin America, you know, 450 to 500 million people live there. Um, I've always wondered why it is the United States through presidents, both Republican and Democrat, ignore the region because the ties, the cultural ties, certainly if you look at our, his, our demographics in the country, we have, um, major populations that come from Latin America, almost every country. And so, you know, the neglect, um, I think, is probably there are missed opportunities. You can see China moving very aggressively into Latin America, um, not with much success, but in terms of big, big uh, commitments where they're, you know, they're gaining influence. It certainly has been something that should be a cause of concern for the United States. So, uh, b- both Africa and, and, and Latin and Latin America in general, from Mexico down to Argentina, create big opportunities. You look at uh, Miami's kind of the capital in many ways of uh, Latin America, at least Central America and South. Um, it's a you know the capital uh, of finance for sure and culture in many ways, and so we see lots of venture capital investing in Miami to Latin America. There's been an explosion of FinTech and um, health tech and delivery services. There's an explosion and and really um, these are uh, in Brazil particularly, but um, all of Latin America is really connected uh, in terms of um, connected through devices to the internet. And uh, there'll be major, major growth based on investment in that area. And that started to become more apparent. Um, and Africa is another place, by the way, that I think there's big opportunities. Uh, but by neglecting these areas, you also uh, don't allow for the kind of support to, to allow for the rule of law to become more embedded, yeah. uh, where there's greater certainty of investment. And so my hope is that uh, the United States, in concert with other countries, um, you know, either stays committed to countries where the rule of law is being challenged um, uh, or works on that uh, to be able to provide more stable source of income. In our case, you know, if you look at the migratory flows from Central America, particularly in the United States, it's people are being pushed out as much as they're being pulled in. And so making sure that Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, um, even Panama and, and, and other countries, Mexico for sure, have stable uh, growing economies. People won't, you know, won't leave their countries of origin if, if there's opportunities there. A Mexican loves Mexico, you know, a Salvadoran loves El Salvador. Uh, but if, it, if there's no opportunities, they'll move. They'll love their children with their heart and soul and they'll move. And so, um, we've done a bad job controlling the border, but we've done as bad a job of not creating economic opportunities, helping create op- opportunities in those countries. 
Jeb, you know, in, in this uh, in this talk also, there is uh, the great uh, American national dream and national myth that, you know, many uh, people around the world uh, look at. And that's why they go to the United States. That's why they get educated there and uh, feel uh, that uh, the United States give them that opportunity to, you know, you know work hard, uh, get rewarded. Uh, uh, how is that? Is that still alive? Is that uh, still uh, something yeah. to? No, I think it is alive, and I'm. Um, I I worry that we begin to have self doubts about it. Uh, and what we should do is to say, what are the things that aren't working as well as they once did, so that we can make sure that we sustain it. But let's don't reject the this. I mean, I don't think it's a myth. If you opened up every border in the country, in the world, okay, and said, God came down in all its, in all God's forms and said, we're going to give you a 30-day free look. You can decide where you want to live. You have 30 days to figure it out. I think there'll be a lot more people coming to the United States than leaving. And there's a reason for that. It's it's not just a myth, it's actually. Uh, there is upward mobility in our country. And if you do work hard and play by the rules, you can succeed. But that's eroded a bit. You know, we need to make sure that that uh, that that dynamism remains intact, which means it shouldn't take 10 years to get a permit to build a bridge. Uh, it means that if you do well in school, you should be able to, in high school, you should be able to go to college without having huge burdens placed on you uh, in terms of student debt. It means um, our tax policy, our labor policy shouldn't be uh, punishing the people that invest in those dreams. So to me, it, it's still alive uh, and it's important uh, that we protect it, but there's work to be done to make sure it gets even better in the 21st century because the world's very, very different than it was just 10 years ago, much less a generation. Very much, very much. Uh, Jeb, my last uh, uh, subject is, uh, although we touched on it, is uh, ESG and diversity and inclusion. And I know you you talked about the uh, maybe the transfer from uh, uh, a lot of emissions to less emissions uh, and how we do that. But uh, tell me, how what are your thoughts on this whole thing about ESG? Uh, I, I mean, and you, it touches your journey in many ways, uh, obviously yeah. uh, oil and gas, but climate change in Florida, you did a lot of things uh, in that. Uh, what are your uh, thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, I think ESG... You're investing, you have to make sure that you check certain boxes and you go to your trustees and make sure you check the boxes. Move on. It has to be um, something that uh, is real. In the United States, if you don't embrace diversity, your people are, are missing out because, for example, in Texas, California, Florida, and many other states, a majority of the students in our K-12 system are minorities. Demographically, we're changing. And if you don't embrace that change and make sure that people have the capacity to achieve earned success, then um, you're miss people are you're not reaching you're, you're not reaching your full potential as a country because people aren't reaching their own full potential. So that kind of diversity to make sure that uh, we're including everybody is important. Um, what we ought to avoid is the political correctness that sometimes comes with inclusion and diversity, where you have diversity and inclusion officers that kind of dictate how you're supposed to think in a, you know, in a, in a, um, you know, anti-racist seminars. And some of this stuff is nutty in my mind, but embracing diversity is not, uh, that can't be just a symbol. That has to be an ongoing effort. And similarly, with governance, you know, full transparency in the world we live in is hugely important. Uh, everything has been digitized. 
you can't hide anything. And I think uh, the governance issues for corporate, the corporate world um, need to reflect that dramatic change that has taken place because of uh, the internet and the access that millions have to it. Uh, and then the environmental issues, again, you can check the box or you can be you know, really focused on meaningful change. So um, I do think it's important to embrace these things, but do it in a substantial way rather than a politically correct way. Does that make sense? And uh, meaningly substantial way, meaning uh, saying climate change, you change planning, cities, things like that. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're a governor or mayor, and if you're mayor of Miami or governor of the state of Florida, rather than get into a political argument about why the climate's changing, what percentage of it is man-made, what percent of it is natural, because we do have, I mean, there is legitimate debate about this put aside the political arguments and say, hey, the, the climate is changing in a place like Miami, which is in my mind, paradise. <laughs> I, love, I love living here. We have to adapt to that reality. And so our land use challenges, uh, how, we, you know, how we approve uh, development, um, how we protect the water systems, how we restore the beauty of the Everglades, all of that is intertwined and we need to make long-term commitments in terms of capital investing and infrastructure to adapt to this reality. If we don't do it today, the costs of it 20 years from now will be extraordinary. So I'm encouraged Governor DeSantis just announced a big uh, chunk of money to go for uh, adaptation strategies. And other cities in this time of abundance are doing the same thing, but that should be a long-term commitment. Yeah. I mean, it seems a lot of governments all around the world uh, I think uh, doesn't seem to realize how how fast this climate change is happening, uh, and the mitigations, like you said, needs to be really serious. Uh, yeah, a lot of government seems to go to a, a storm hit area and help people uh, establish again at the same place and the, with the same system. Yeah. So you know. There's lots of things that need to be changed. How we ensure um, our, you know, what, what, what's the commitment of local and state government to capital investing versus spending in the here and now. Over time, most governments, including the federal government, have spent less and less on investing in the long-term things and more and more on entitlements and spending in, you know, current obligations. So as you crowd out those capital investing opportunities, you're also not making the kind of commitment to um, adapt. So that the infrastructure bill was a good counter to that uh, in the United States. And uh, done right, where you lever, this is a place where private investing could play a huge role, Mohammed. And this is, you look at the number of, the amount of money, pension funds and big uh, infrastructure fund investors how much money they have when you lever that with state, local, and federal monies in, in the United States, you could you could be investing trillions of dollars in infrastructure, part of which uh, should deal with uh, the changing climate. Uh, Jeb, related to uh, you know ESG uh, and really what COVID has uh, has brought is the uh, going back to work, going back to office. Uh, yeah. And you know we've uh, we've gone through from totally work from home to partial to hybrid. Uh, what is your thoughts on this? And uh, are we sending the right messages about the future of work? Um, I'm very frustrated by uh, the convoluted messaging in the United States about COVID. Uh, experts have been wrong. I think part of the problem has been that our political leaders lacked humility during a time of crisis. To me, it's okay as a public leader to say, we don't know exactly how this is gonna play out. We're gonna let science dictate this, but we're not gonna be rigid about this because conditions could change and they did change. The third wave of the virus is dramatically different than the first or the second. Each one had its unique challenges and public health officials, I think got too rigid, certainly, you know, we allowed the politicization of 
of COVID policies. What, what I know to be true is that there's no direct correlation between the degree to which governments at the state and local level shut down their, um, their jurisdictions and the, the level of, of uh, infections and deaths. Florida, which has been an open state, has had, you know, it's basically at the right in the middle of uh, infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. States that were shutting down completely, where people lost their livelihood in many ways and continue to shut down because of, um, I think, politics, have, have not seen a dramatic decrease in the number of people infected, but they've seen a dramatic increase in the loss of economic livelihood. So enough humility next time around would be helpful, I think, just to be able to say, we don't know exactly how this is going to play out. Um, but we ought to have a bias towards action. Schools should have never shut down to the degree that they did. The loss of learning is generational. For two years, if you lose learning, that those learning losses aren't going to be regained by you know, a flip of a switch. Um, the amount of uh, tragedies taking place in terms of addiction, alcoholism, domestic violence, foster care increases, loss of economic livelihood, those should be factored into any public health uh, considerations that took place. So there's a lot of lessons learned here as, as it relates to supply chain, as it relates to confidence in our public health. But yeah, offices should be open. Um, we've learned that you don't have to have uh, the old way completely. I mean, we're doing this conversation via Zoom. I'm in my office, but you know, I, I, in my office is comprised of Maria, Jeb, and Jeb Jr., we stayed open the whole time, but a lot of offices, um, people have worked effectively remotely. So I don't think we should mandate and dictate how businesses will operate going forward, but there's a lot of lessons that have been learned. And certainly technology now allows for more flexibility. If you can customize your life and be productive in a business, but also take care of a sick child or take care of your mom who may be ailing, why not? I mean, Shouldn't we allow that kind of flexibility to, to add more purpose in people's lives so that they, they actually continue to be productive, but also take care of things that are important to them? Yeah, very good. So finally, uh, Jeb, we finish normally with a rapid fire kind of questions. Uh, and the first question is, uh, what is your favorite city outside uh, Texas and Florida? Oh, outside of Texas and Florida. I have to think about that. Um, I used to, you know what? I, I can't say that anymore because San Francisco has changed. I loved San Francisco. Um, it's, but it's very different today than it was a decade ago. So let me think. I, I like Nashville. If I was going to start over, Nashville is one of the places I'd consider living. Although I would never consider li leaving Florida because I love Love my state. Nashville is a booming place with a great economy and great people. Um, outside of the United States, I'm a, um, I, love, uh, I love going to Singapore. It's a city that works really well. It's beautiful. It reminds me of Miami when I, when I land there. And the, uh, the downtown has a similar feel, similar to Hong Kong as well. I love cities with uh, beautiful uh, water views. Those are two great cities for sure. Very good. A uh, recent uh, book you read? I'm reading a book right now. Um, I wish I said I can complete it, but it's it's about this thick. It's uh, The Last King. It's about King George III, written by Andrew Roberts, a great uh, British author who has written books, biographies on Churchill, certainly, and, and um, Napoleon. It's an interesting book because it kind of defies what we all learn as Americans when we're going to school about the American Revolution. Turns out, according to Andrew Roberts, King George III wasn't such a horrible man. <laughs> so good, good to get you know new perspectives. Um, I'm happy we we won the American Revolution, but um, he wasn't the despot that uh, we we've been told in elementary school. Okay, that sounds like good. I, I'm going to take that name. Uh, an unexpected uh, hobby. Um, I like cooking for my wife. Right. Um, and during the pandemic, you know, that was about all we did other than work and work out, you know? So I like, I like doing that. I like, uh, honoring my wife by cooking her meals. 
And the, and the last one, uh, Florida or Texas? You know, I'm a Texan by birth, a Floridian by choice. So it's Florida all the way. I love, I love my Texas roots. Um, I love the, the spirit of Texas, but Florida is a place of incredible opportunity. And I've been totally blessed to live here for, gosh, since 1981. So a long time. Jeb, thank you so much. Uh, it was a great honor to have you. Thank you for your time. And uh, please take care and give our regards to all the family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care.